All right, list and describe uh, the three or more basic arguments for the existence of God that are based upon what we may observe in na nature. Anyone? Teleological. Uh, the teleological argument, to telos, is uh, purpose. purpose, goal. There's design that we can see in creation. Um, we can see mm -hmm. a, a mind at work, giving, being organizing and ordering, um, a designer at work. Uh, what's another one? Ontological. Ontological. Go ahead and explain that one, Dan. <laughs> it involves that then which nothing greater can be thought. Yes. And I don't find it especially persuasive. Okay. Recognizing that many very <laughs> smart people do. Yes, many smart people do. Uh, there may be even one of those smart people in this room, but for most of us, how one gets from the, the realm of thinking to the realm of being escapes us. All right, another one. Cosmological. Cosmological. Because something exists, um, something had to exist before. Something can't come from nothing. Right, the fact that there is something rather than nothing means that there must be a trail of causation that goes back to something, right? You can't have the universe just erupting into being out of sheer nothingness. So eternity is built into the fabric of the universe. Something had always to be there for there to be something here now. And even if we're not able to trace back to that original thing, we start putting these arguments together, the cosmological, there's something and it's eternal, and the teleological and it's thinking, it, uh, it brings order. It's, um, you know, so it must be personal and, and, and rational, and so you start to shape, you, you, you begin to develop something of a picture of, of, the, of the biblical God. What else? Anthropological. Anthropological, yeah, the whole idea of humanity with, um, with uh, religious impulse and moral motions, um, with ability to create. Um, that, that, again, that, 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 that arriving on the scene in an impersonal, non-thinking, non-rational, non-creative uh, universe is, um, is, uh, is difficult to imagine. Whatever that original thing is, it must be superior to us if we are the, the product of it. it. It cannot be less than us. And, and given that we have these moral motions, there, you, uh, one would deduce that there must be a, a, a moral, uh, it's reasonable at least to say that there is a, 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 a moral source um, in the universe um, to which homage is to be paid. Okay, any others? Historical. Historical. Um, you, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the long run, uh, righteousness is rewarded and, and, and sin is punished. There, there, there would appear to be a judge out there who, who, who reckons with the nations, and they rise and fall by his hands. And the, the Ninevehs of the world, they face, they face judgment, and they're called to repentance, and when they don't, they're, they are, they're brought low. Uh, okay, second one, God's attributes are usually invi uh, divided into two categories. What are they? Communicable and incommunicable. Communicable is? Pertains only to God. That's, the That's incommunicable. Pertains only to God. Uh, communicable, you know, in some ways it, 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 it relates to us. So God's infinity relate to the following, to space, omnipresence. omnipresence or immensity. Some of the older theologians would use that word. Time, eternal, eternal. Uh, power. Omnipotence, knowledge, omniscience, omniscience. omniscience. Uh, character, holy, okay. Uh, God's goodness embraces the attributes of mercy, mercy. 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 Love. love, love, compassion, graciousness, compassion. graciousness. Patience. patience, yes, yes. That's the, that's the overarching category that the, you know, traditionally the, the uh, theologians have used to examine all that whole family of attributes. Uh, what is the difference between the economic and the ontological trinity? The economic trinity describes them as the persons of the trinity as different according to their works. Yes. 
So if you really want to get into it, there's the ad intra and the ad extra. Um, the ad intra, within the Trinity, there's this uh, uh, unity of essence, uh, equally eternal and omnipotent and omniscience, and uh, of the same substance and essence and equally deity. Um, that's the uh, ad intra um, r relationship between the, the three persons of the Trinity. But uh, ad extra, that is what they do outside of themselves, what the, some have called the economic trinity, is the division of labor. What each, they are all at work in each other's works. So that needs to be understood. But in addition to that, there are those works that are primarily um, assigned to one rather than the other. And so redemption is primarily of, of the son and creation uh, of the father and ap application of redemption to the spirit. I, I, even though, like I say, they're, they're, they are, because they share that essence, they are all at work in each other's works. And nevertheless, we can talk meaningfully about the Son as the, the Redeemer. Um, is the intra idea that you just expressed, is that the same as ontological? Yes, intra, within, yeah. Okay, uh, what does the... How does the Bible set forth the doctrine of the Trinity and where? Uh, chapter 20, Genesis 1, 26, let us make man in our Okay, there's a little hint, right? Let us, there's a plural pronoun. Calvin dismisses that argument for some reason, but mo most theologians John would say. John 17, 5. John 17, 5. The high priestly prayer, glorify me with that glory I had with you before the world was. Yeah. Okay, so th those are some of the passages, but if we if we take kind of the view at 50,000 feet, uh, we see they're that... Equal. They're equal in their works. Um, equal in their works. Um, their uh, creation, or redemption, they, they all are attributed, their works are attributed variously among them. Okay, so we, we see that, they, that the works... The attributes, the names, the, names, the, worship, the, worship. the worship. What am I missing? Anyway, that's a good start. Are attributed to each one. Um, and, and yet the Bible teaches there is but one God. And it also teaches that the, the three, the, fa the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, are separate persons. And so when we go to, to Matthew 28, 18, and we see baptize them in the name singular of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, singular name, singular essence, three persons, um, diversity of persons within the unity of the Godhead, you, you see yet another, an, another hint, another glimpse at uh, the doctrine of the Trinity. So it's not, it's not in one place, of course. It has to be pulled together from the, the whole of biblical revelation. Um, and it is more a New Testament revelation than an Old Testament revelation. That uh, there are three persons in the Godhead. Um, so catechism question, number four, what is God? God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Just rolls off the tongue. <laughs> Infinite, eternal, and unchangeable, and his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, truth. Huh? Easy. All right. Uh, how many persons are there in the Godhead? There are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one God, the same in substance, and equal in power and glory. All right. Any leftover questions from last week? then um, let us push on. So you have the text of the catechism, or rather the confession in front of you. And so what I want to do is with this larger print, I want to go ahead and just read several of these sections. Let's go through the first two. 
God's eternal decree. The, 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 the issue here is, does God have a plan? Does he have a plan? Does he have a purpose? Uh, when did he begin to have a plan? Uh, when did he formulate that purpose? Uh, and the answer is uh, that in all eternity. His plan is an eternal pl plan. Uh, his, his plan is rooted in his own eternal counsels. He, there, there, there is a purpose behind all that takes place. And it is God's purpose. And it is rooted in eternity. So, God from all eternity. In other words, he, he didn't make things up along the way. There's no plan B. There's no plan C. From all eternity, he did by his most wise and holy counsel of his own will. With whom did he discuss the plan? Um, you know, Isaiah chapter 40. Who were his counselors? I mean, that's the astonishment there of, you know, the prophet Isaiah. Who, who, were, who were his counselors? He, he stretched out the heavens by himself. He laid the foundations of the earth. He numbered the stars and called them by name. He measured out the waters in the hollow of his hand. He, um, he measured the hills in a balance and the mountains upon a scale. And who advised him? Who, who counseled him? Uh, and the answer is uh, no one. No one. So, um, so uh, unchangeably ordained, um, Right, 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 right. most wise and holy counsel of his own will. No outside advisors were involved in this. Freely, there was no com nothing compelling him to create. There was no necessity in creation. There wasn't a need that was being filled in, in creation. God didn't create because uh, he was lonely or, or some other imaginary reason. No, he, he freely and unchangeably uh, or, uh, ordained whatever comes to pass. Uh, what he has ordained uh, is unalterable. It is it, like it, it, it's eternal. If it's un eternal, it's immutable. It, it's it's not uh, a plan that is that is changing over time. That he's altering. That he's adjusting. That he's adapting. Uh, no, it's it's eternal, and it is comprehensive. He, he did ordain whatsoever comes to pass. All right, yet, so as neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. So this is, I think, the, hopefully we'll see it's the genius of the Bible, it's the genius of the confession. These two things are held in tension, and they're not reconciled. Um, contingency of second causes taken away, uh, no, you know, when I drop the pin, uh, that's, a, that's, you know, that falls by a second cause. Was that also ordained from the foundation of the world? Yes. Because God's plan is comprehensive. When one of my hairs falls out of my head, changing the number of hairs in my head, um, was that ordained from the foundation of the earth? So, something that uh, small and seemingly irrelevant, is that all part of the plan and purpose of God? Yes. Jesus says he's numbered the hairs upon your head, right? So that's a way of indicating the detail, the, the, the minuscule um, and comprehensive interest that, that, that God has and that God ordains. Uh, but the contingency or liberty of second causes, I dropped the pen. I didn't drop it because something, you know, God picked up my hand and said, now to illustrate this point coming down the road, you're going to, do, you're going to need to drop the pen to make the point to this class, and oop, you were about to forget to do it, so suddenly my arm jerked up and, 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 and it dropped because God com compelled me in a way contrary to the nature of second causes to do that. Is that what happened? No. No, he didn't. It, there was a whole series of causations beginning with, you know, rolling out of bed this morning that got me here at this time with this pin here to drop it at that point, and yet uh, was any of that by surprise? Was any of that... Um, unanticipated? Is there any of that outside of the plan and purpose of God? No. Uh, so these things are compatible with each other. God could have ordained that I do the dropping of the pin from eternity, and, and, and yet um, my doing so was uncoerced, unforced. I did it freely. Um, I did it uh, because I chose to do it. And these two things it's vital that we hold these two things in, in tension with each other. Both are true. We cannot reconcile them. They are reconciled somewhere in the mind of God in eternity, but we will not be able to figure that out. We have to affirm them both and not, um, 
uh, not um, abandon one at the expense of the other, not explain away one at the expense of the other. Uh, let's read this second paragraph as well. Although God knows whatever may or can come to pass, upon all supposed conditions, yet hath he not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future or as that which would come to pass upon such conditions. So this is a, this is a rebuttal of, of um, you know, Arminianism that wants to preserve the idea of predestination but wants to root it in foreknowledge so that you really don't have predestination. You have a God who foresees and what he foresees is, um, is what people are going to do anyway. Um, and th this is uh, rejecting that idea. God knows all the supposed conditions. He knows how things might have turned out or could have turned out if given all the infinite, virtually infinite number of uh, variables. Yet he's not decreed anything because he foresaw it as future. No, he, he, he didn't base what he decreed upon foreknowledge. Um, he's not looking out into a vacuum somewhere. He is decreeing what will happen. And that's what takes place. What he ordains should take place, not because he foresees it, be, but because it suits his purpose. I mean, uh, the backwards way of reasoning with that is to say, if, if he far, foresaw something that was outside of his purpose, he wouldn't have allowed it. He would have forbidden it. He would have, pro he would have prevented it. What did he allow? He allowed what suited his purpose. He permitted what, uh, what, what uh, was uh, corresponded with his plan. Uh, and that's why I think that those who want to seek refuge in foreknowledge and as a way to escape the implications of the decrees and predestination and, and our doctrine of providence, I think they, um, they're not thinking clearly about the relationship between foreknowledge and, and omnipotence and omniscience. God doesn't foresee anything but what he ordains he should see. He, he doesn't allow to happen anything but that which suits his purpose, which was formed in eternity. So to get to the questions then, Jerry, can I ask a question about um, number one? You said number two um, strikes at the um, based on foreknowledge idea. Was there um, like dispensational thinking at the time of the divine? So they're not saying. No, it's Arminian. It's Arminianism that's being rebutted because they're saying. They want to explain predestination as God foreseeing those who would believe and then he chooses them. Right, but I'm talking about number one, the, the phrase, God from all eternity. In other words, dispensationalists think that God tried a plan and it didn't work, so he had to come up with something else that might work and that didn't work, so he had to come up with something else. Are they striking at that or is that just? That's, that's just out there in the future somewhere. We're a couple of hundred years before that. So, how comprehensive is the decree or plan of God? Total. Whatsoever. Totally. How, totally. Upon how much of what actually takes place does his decree have an effect? All of it. All, All of it. Everything. Does it include salvation and damnation? Uh, all means all. Uh, so, let's, uh, let's go ahead uh, and read further. By, by the decree of God for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated unto everlasting life and others foreordained to everlasting death. Seeing the difference, you know, the word, use of the words predestined and foreordained, there, there's significance to that as well. Um, not that he would desire for anyone to, to, um, to perish in death, but knowing that it's going to happen, that's, that's, that's part of his overall plan. All right, we'll come back to that. These angels and men thus predestinated and foreordained are particularly and unchangeably designed and their number so certain and definite that it cannot be increased or diminished. And then to go on to paragraph 6 for a moment. As God hath appointed the elect unto glory, so he hath by the eternal and most free purpose of his will foreordained the means thereunto. Wherefore, they who are elected, being fallen in Adam, are redeemed by Christ, are effectually called unto faith in Christ by his spirit, working in due season, are justified, adopted, sanctified, and kept by his power through faith unto salvation, 
Neither are any other redeemed by Christ, effectually called, justified, adopted, sanctified, and saved, but the elect only. Um, does it include salvation and damnation? Um, according to the confession, it certainly, it, it certainly does. It's, uh, it's compre comprehensive. So well, where do you get that? Do you, do you find that in uh, the Bible? Um, so as for the, the comprehensiveness of the decrees, we go to places like this. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according. So there's that word again, that pesky word, predestined. Yeah, I mean, one of the answers to people that, to, that say, I don't believe in predestination, is the, one of the answers to that is, well, then how do you explain the use of the word? How do you interpret the use of the word? I mean, because it's there in the Bible. It's a biblical doctrine. So you tell me how, how we're to understand the meaning of that word. So here it is. According to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. That, you can hear the echo of the language of the confession there. Okay, so the language of purpose. Um, with whom does he consult? He consults with his own will. Uh, he predestines according to his purpose. Beca as he works all things, works all things, nothing is outside of the all things according to the counsel of his will. Um, Isaiah 45, 7, I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create, uh, the, the, the Hebrew word there is the word for evil. Wow. I create so right, uh, rightly uh, translated calamity, but to see how daring the language is. Uh, God is not the author of evil, uh, but nevertheless, the, the sort of the temporal evils that we experience, the calamities, the disasters, the hardships, the accidents, so-called. Um, I, I form light and create darkness. I, form, I, I make well-being and calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things things. Similarly, Amos 3.6. Uh, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, and yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? Um, so Jesus, uh, in this and then the next uh, statement as well, is, is trying to point to the most seemingly irrelevant of things. Um, as, as surely God is, is, is not concerned about these kind of details. God is not involved in these things. A sparrow falls from a tree. It's just a bird. It's a sparrow. It's worthless. Um, uh, nobody pays any attention to that. Nobody cares about that. Nobody hardly even observes that. I mean, I've never found a dead sparrow in my backyard. Maybe you have. But it's just, it seems to be a thing of no consequence whatsoever. A and yet he says, not one of them falls apart, uh, falls around, apart from your father. In other words, apart from God's will, the birds do not fall out of the trees. They don't die and fall out of the trees, except according to his will, his purpose, his plan. Uh, the same with this, are, are not even the hairs of your head. Again, he's pointing to the things that are just uh, irrelevant to us, the things that are inconsequential, the things that don't matter to us. I mean, some of your matters more than others. Glares coming off of some of the heads up there in, 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 in the middle. Uh, but, uh, I mean, if you lose one, all right, I understand, that's, uh, that's important to you, but, you know, you know, if another hair turns up in a, in a hairbrush uh, tomorrow, that's, you know, what's, what's that? Nothing to us. Uh, uh, God knows when it goes from, w when there's one less hair on your head, he knows the number. He knows how many are there now, one falls out, he knows, he knows it's fallen out, and he knows the number that remained. The point, that is detailed comprehensive will, comprehensive knowledge, comprehensive um, ordering and purposing and planning and ordaining and controlling. It's all wrapped up in his massive intellect and will. Um, uh, here, so the, the, uh, the prototype, um, the paradigm for, for this and I think one of the most convincing arguments is to go to the cross. Um, it, you know, it, it, here, here you would think would be maybe the most difficult of all events. You have the greatest evil ever committed in the history of the world when this perfectly just, righteous, holy, 
gracious, merciful, kind man, Jesus is seized by the authorities and he's put to death. So you have humanity at its worst, uh, humanity committing its greatest evil, and, and yet to look at the language, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, uh, you crucified. And there's the point about human responsibility. There, 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 there it is in one verse. This is Peter's Pentecost sermon. And, and in the, he, he, uh, do, these, do these high doctrines of predestination, do they belong in ordinary gospel preaching? Well, the very first gospel sermon, he's saying, look, God is in control of this. You thought you were in control. No, 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 no. You don't understand. Uh, he was in control. And you did the worst that you can do. Uh, but he causes the wrath of man to praise him. So this, Jesus delivered up by according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. It was planned. It was his purpose that Jesus should die. And Jesus dying, a multitude that nobody can number, will be saved from every nation, tongue, and tribe. But does that absolve you of the responsibility? Can you then back off and just say, uh, and, and just say well, uh, look, I did this good thing then because I killed Jesus. Um, that means that I've, I've done this good thing because so many people will get saved. No, you cr crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. In other words, you're responsible for what you did. How do you put those two things together? Well, he, Peter didn't bother to put them together. They're both true. God is sovereign. He's in control. Uh, he has a plan. He has a purpose. It's going, for, it's going forward. We've got the end of the story in the back of the book, right? So uh, we know where it's going to all end up. Uh, it, but God's purpose will be fulfilled, um, and, and, and human beings are responsible for what they do despite the fact that the plan of God is eternal. Somehow, sovereignty of God and human responsibility are not in conflict. How do they come together? Uh, Spurgeon said, for, from our point of view, it's like two railroad tracks going off into eternity that never intersect. In eternity, somewhere, they do intersect, apparently, and it will make sense. Uh, in the meantime, they're just parallel tracks for us. And if you cr try to cross them, the train is going to jump the track. You'll get off one way or another, become a fatalist on one end and put it all in the sovereignty of God or you'll uh, really deny, deny, you'll deny bas basic truths about God. You'll end up with a false God. All right, the, the lot is cast into the lap. Uh, lo the lot, that's where we get our word lottery. So this is like the rolling of the dice, the drawing of straws. It's cast into the lap. Well, so you talk about something that is of uh, no consequence. You're just rolling some dice. The, the, the numbers that come up, uh, God decides that. Once again, Bible's pointing to, you know, things that are of no consequence. And yet, God is sovereign over the roll of the dice. Um, the second part of question one is, what's the second part of question one? Does it include salvation and damnation? All right. Does it include salvation and damnation? Ephesians 1, 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him when? Before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will this is all, all this confessional language is just being drawn out of these passages uh, and all, all you know Ephesians 1 just builds this case all to the glory of his grace so salvation and damnation um, we can go to Romans 9, where the Apostle Paul takes on the issue of why is it that some is in Israel believe and some in Israel do not believe. Why, are there, why is there just a remnant of believing Jews who believe Jesus is the Messiah and the Savior of the world, and then there's this big group that don't believe that? And his, uh, his, his answer is election. So he argues like this. 
It's not as though the word of God has failed. You think the gospel failed? It's just a weak message, a defective message, and so people don't believe it because it just, it's, not, um, it's not compelling. Um, it's not persuasive. It's, 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 it's a weak message. No, it's not failed for not all are, who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. There's an Israel within the Israel, just like in the church. There's a church within the church. There's the church and its membership, and then there are the real Christians. And those are not coterminous. They, don't, they, they are not the same. So there is an Israel within Israel. There's a church within the church. Um, and not all the children of Abraham, um, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. There was another son, wasn't there? Who was he? Ishmael. Right, there was an Ishmael. I, is he one of the, is he a believer? Is he one of the elect? No. He's outside. Uh, uh, this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Um, for this is what the promise said about this time next year. I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had not done anything, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Uh, she was told, the older will serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it. So just, you know, unpack, um, unpack this. Um, uh, it, it's really extraordinary what the Apostle Paul is arguing here. You have Rebecca. She is pregnant with two children. They are sharing the same womb at the same time in the same mother from the same father. And before they were born, before they could do, do good or evil, God chose the one and not the other. Jacob was chosen. Esau was passed over. Why are some in Israel uh, saved and others are not saved? Because God is sovereign. Because he chooses some and doesn't choose others. So, and again, the language, God's purpose. Um, and this, this, this language, not yet born. You see with the Apostle Paul, he, he's, he's, this cannot be explained away. He is driving home the point. Not yet born. Uh, not, not done either good or bad. And, and so that it wouldn't be, you wouldn't say, well, you know, it was that... Uh, you know, Esau was a bad guy, and that's why God chose Jacob. No, that's exactly contrary to the point. It, it, they had not done good or bad, and, and the reason they were chosen before they were born, so that, that we would know it was God's purpose that was, in the end, determinate, determinative uh, of the outcome. And it's not exactly as though Jacob was an upstanding moral character. No, and if you really want to read a great chapter, get Knowing God and the chapter on... Um, See, it's one of the two chapters on guidance about God dealing with Jacob. It's a fantastic chapter, fantastic uh, biographical study of, of, of a twisted Jacob, God bringing an even more twisted Laban into the life of twisted Jacob in order to untwist Jacob. Gave him more of his own treatment. Um, so, what, what, again, let's, let's just continue with the Apostle Paul's argument. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? Listen, that's exactly what the ordinary person, you might be sitting there right now thinking that very thought. Wait a minute. How's that? That's not fair. Um, that's unjust on God's part. Well, why, why would he do that? Um, how, how, how can that be considered fair? Is there injustice with God? The fact that the Apostle Paul is asking that question proves that we've got, the, the, we've got his meaning correct. By no means, for he says, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have. What kind of an answer is that? that that's, that's God just saying, I'm God, and I'll, have, I'll, give, I'll show compassion where I please to show compassion, and I'll show mercy where I'm pleased to show mercy, and that's the end of the story. You've got nothing more to say. Why? Because I'm God. Does um, not the potter have? We're, we're getting there. We're getting to the potter. It, uh, so, 
Did you, if you miss the meaning, so then it depends not on the human will or exertion, but on God who shows the mercy. All right. It does not depend on human will or exertion, but on God. It does not depend on human will. If you are saved, uh, and it's not because of your will. And we'll, we'll keep circling around back to this. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whoever he wills. You will say, To me, then, why does he still find fault? Once again, the Apostle Paul confirming that we have understood him right because he raises your objection, right? This is our objection. Uh, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? I mean, I, 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 I'm doomed. I mean, I'm just locked into whatever God has ordained is, is going to be. So at that point, the Apostle Paul says, all right, we've taken this as far as we can go. We will go no further. So, he says, but who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? Okay, so that's not, that's not, that's not a answering the question, right? At that point, he's saying, okay, this is gone. we've taken this as far as we can go. We, what have we established? That ultimately, the plan of God is going forward. He's not being frustrated. His purpose is not being thwarted. It's eternal. It is uh, immutable. It is moving forward. A and... Um, and uh, human unbelief um, uh, th that, that were reduced to a remnant is not evidence of some failure of the plan or some failure of the means or some failure of the gospel or failure of anything else. So I've, I've been pushing that point. You keep pushing back, but you know what? Now, all right, who are you, O oh man, who answers back to God? Well, uh, what is molded, say to the molder, what ha why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use. Uh, what does the Apostle Paul liken us to? It's a simple substance, clay, to be fashioned by God according to his own will, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. He's just flattening us out. The, the objection of fairness has an unspoken assumption that God owes mercy, that he owes us at least a chance, which of course the Arminian says it's always a chance, but that, that the mercy is something that we can demand of God. Mm. And when it's stated, it, it becomes self-evidently false, but that that's, yeah. I think, what's in the background. So when we get to the fun time that we'll have with infra versus superlapsarianism, um, you'll, we'll, we'll get to the point that I think is important about infralapsarianism is that we have God choosing out of the mass of fallen humanity where nobody deserves mercy. Mercy, by definition, is not deserved. As soon as you're talking about deserve, you deserve mercy, um, you're no longer dealing with mercy, you're dealing with justice. So you've just, you know, you've redefined the terminology and, to, and just defined mercy out of existence. It's God to show mercy because he's not obligated. Uh, he, when he elects and chooses, it's out of the mass of fallen humanity, none of whom deserve any mercy, but in his grace he chooses to save some. But we'll get to that in a moment. Jesus says to the disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I mean, as uh, my uh, Old Testament uh, beloved, revered Alec Motier in England would say, that a child can understand that these are all single syllable words. <laughs> right? You did not choose me, but I chose you. What's, what's ambiguous about that? See, what they could have said was, yeah, well, we did. Remember, we were, you came by the Sea of Galilee, and you said, come and follow me, and we, we, we put down our nets, and we followed you. We did choose you. But the point is, your choice was of such secondary importance, is so inconsequential that I can just use categorical language like this and say, you know what, you didn't choose me. Your choice was virtually irrelevant. My choice was 
what determined the outcome. I chose you. That's why you follow me. So you, in fact, did not choose me. I chose you. Because I chose you, then you responded. But my choice was the all-important factor. And that has been true of every disciple of Jesus ever since. We did not choose him. He chose us. We responded. Uh, but the, the important decision that was made was his decision to choose us in Christ for salvation and then to draw us to Christ by faith so that we might be saved. Uh, a se a second uh, Timothy 1.9, uh, he, sa he saved us and called us to a holy calling. Well, I, I mean, the, the, full, the full picture is divine sovereignty, human responsibility. So I don't have any hesitation at all with a Christian preacher pleading for someone to take the gift. Because there is human responsibility, and divine sovereignty doesn't nullify the reality of the responsibility and the fact that on Judgment Day you won't be able to say, well, I didn't believe because I wasn't predestinated because it won't be true. You didn't believe because you didn't want to believe because you're a rebel. Um, so that's what I'm saying. The railroad tracks have to be kept parallel. We can't cross them. We, ha we, we, we have to uh, understand the finite limits of our, of our, of our minds to, to take in what uh, is, is um, the, the, the in, in infinite dimensions of the purposes and plans of God. So we hold them in tension. Yes, Matthew? And that, that scenario suggests or assumes that the, the one who is offered the gift has the capability or the interest in receiving it. it as we're not equal at that point. We yeah. don't want to receive until God yeah. moves. Yeah. yeah, so that's an important corrective in your question is that I think often there's this um, perception that I have within myself the capacity to either believe or not believe. Well, when in fact, until, uh, until amazing grace comes and opens blind eyes and softens a hard heart and opens deaf ears, I will not see, I will not hear, I will not respond. It won't happen uh, until God initiates. He in initiates our salvation. Morris? We were dead in our trespasses and sins. You can't make a choice when you're yeah. dead. Yeah. 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 Oh, dry, I, I love uh, Ezekiel 37. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. How do dry bones listen? Ezekiel's commanded, go preach to, a, you know, in, in Hebrew, it's, uh, it's, it's a two, two, the, the, the word very is doubled. It's very, very dry. It's not just dry, very, very dry bones. I mean, they, they are dry. There's no, there's no moisture in the marrow, all right? They have been bleached completely dry. And he's commanded to do what is the ultimate in futility, which is to go out and preach to dry bones. Oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Well, we were, we were dead. And God made us alive. How? Through gospel proclamation. All right. Um, so other passages, maybe some of these less uh, well known. Uh, he, he, he saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace uh, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Again, he's rooting our salvation in eternity, in, a perp in God's eternal purposes. Uh, Romans uh, 8, 28 to 30, uh, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestinated uh, to be, uh, and even this word foreknew, um, Maybe it means to know ahead of time, but you know, to know Adam knew Eve and she conceived and bore a son. You know, to foreknow is to set your love upon another. Um, those whom God set His love upon, He predestined. Uh, it's, it's not just bare. It's not just bare awareness of facts of the person's existence. When when we run into that word foreknowledge, question. Doesn't it seem that Paul? saying whom he foreknew he also predestined he's 
saying you can't just, it's just not based on foreknowledge because he's saying there those who born, you know, it's, it's based on predestination. Yeah. And he's addressing that, those that say it's God, you know, knew what he was going to do and he knew what man was going to do. Yeah. Right. right. Yes. Yeah, I think the, the confession acknowledges that when it says in, in part two that whatsoever may or can come to pass, is that, is that like, I think uh, David David uh, saves some city and Saul's coming and he calls for the ephod and says, are they going to hand me over? And God says, yes, they'll hand you over. And so he, he flees the city and obviously doesn't get handed over. Uh, God knew that he would flee the city, of yeah. course, right? Yeah, the convention is, is affirming that God knew all possible eventualities and, and, and purposed one as opposed to the almost limitless number of, of other possibilities. Yes? Is it right to say that predestina predestination builds on foreknowledge? Because he foreknew everything that's come to pass, but he, fore he predestined some of us to be his elect. Does that... Well, they're on a slippery slope there. That he, why, why would he, why did he for, why, why did he, why did he, what did he foresee in you that made him choose you? Was it because you were so smart? Was it because you were so handsome? Was it because you were so virtuous? Uh, what to caused him? What did he see? And the confession is arguing he didn't see anything. There was nothing in you that drew the choice. No, nothing that in you that to caused him to predestine you, to set you apart from other people. It was it was sovereign, gratuitous election. Uh, yes. Ben? I, I think I, I'm curious to know your thoughts on how how the decrees relate to God in in their like eternalness. Um, if like they have if they have always been eternal, and if we we sometimes say that like God exists outside of it's not as if like, oh, like God created the world, and then once he had that idea in place, then he had that idea to say, like, oh, like, now I'm going to save some of these people. I did, and I'm, I'm curious as we get into the last area and stuff, like, yeah. why, why does the word matter if God is eternal and unchangeable, and there, it wasn't, there, there wasn't like a step one, two, three, and four of this? Yeah, so you're, you're already into succession and time, and so that's got to be ruled out of court. So some of the orthodox reform theologians want to say the whole discussion of the order of decrees is out of order because there's no succession in the mind of God. It's all comprehensive and eternally one. And, and so the whole idea that this came and then this came and then this came is, is, is wrong. So you have to get all the elements of time out of there. Uh, we'll, get to that. we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, all right, so conform to the image of the Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, uh, he also then called by the gospel, and whom he called, he justified, and whom he justified, he glorified. You got, you got the whole, the whole what's, uh, what's been referred to as the chain of salvation. All the links basically are being, uh, being connected there. And uh, adoption is in the verse before this. Um, it's, all, it's all according to God's purpose and plan and his predestinating his election. Um, we ought always to give thanks for God, for you brothers, beloved of the Lord, because God chose you as to be the first, uh, as the first fruits to be saved through their sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth. Um, so I think when you just step back and you say, now what, 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 what is Paul just laboring to say in passage after passage after passage? I remember when I first was fighting against the whole idea of predestination, Somebody wisely said to me, uh, you start looking for it, you're going to find it's on every other page of the Bible. You're going to see some hint of predestination, the sovereignty of God, election, so forth. I mean, go, go back. Why Noah? Why Abraham? Why Isaac? Why Jacob? You know, you <laughs> and, and then why Judah? And why Jesus through, you know, it's why Paul? Why, 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 Paul? why not some other Pharisee? Why not some other guy out there trying to murder Christians? Why Paul? It's all election. God had been just graciously saving, rescuing, delivering people who, who don't deserve it. Uh, but he, he, does it, he does it anyway. One more, Terry. Uh, Philippians 2, for if God worth the meaning both to will and to do. Yes. 
Yeah, following on, by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves as a gift to God, not according to works, lest anybody, unless anyone should boast. You are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people that are not reformed try to point to different passages to say that God changed his mind. Um, the one that I was thinking of is Jonah, where in Jonah 3 it just says, none of it's going to be destroyed. And then there's no out. And then at the end, God, it says God saw their works. Yeah. And and so like to read that straightforwardly would seem like that God foreordained destruction, and then based on their works, He changed yeah. His mind. So did God change or did Nineveh change? I think that's the answer. Who changed? And in the message of judgment is implied a message of repentance from the sins of which God is threatening to destroy you. And repentance is a path of deliverance, which turns out to be the story. In other words, you're not getting a, you know, a full text of what Jonah is preaching, but and, implied. And you don't have to guess at that because he says it in chapter four. Jonah himself says that, saying, saying that. I knew. They, 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 they I knew this is what you were going to do. Right. Yeah, <laughs> I knew that this was the, uh, going to happen. Would that be an example of condescension? Excuse me. Would that be an example of condescension, like God yes. sort of? Lowering yes. himself so that we could understand him. Um, I, yeah, yes, I, and I, I just think that you know, I, even in the Book of Acts, you, you, you get you're getting con- uh, condensed versions of sermons. Mm-hmm. You you do have to connect some of the dots. If Jonah is, Jonah is there preaching judgment, in that message is a call to repentance, and in the call to repentance is the promise of deliverance from the judgment that's being threatened. All that is implied in. Jonah going and then is brought out in Jonah's complaint. I knew this was going to happen. I knew they'd repent and you would, you would save them. Is that what you mean, Robert? Yeah. Okay, we should try to make a little more progress than we're making right now. Um, <laughs> what influenced God to decree and plan, uh, plan, uh, plan what he has? <laughs> right, right. In the end, it is, it is all too God's own glory. Um, actually, I, j- I jumped ahead too soon. I-, I meant to put these in front of you as well. Um, uh, Don't blame us for going so slow. Let's see. Does this help at all? Although in relation to foreknowledge and the decree of God, this is from Confession 5.2. Uh, the first cause of all things come to pass immutably and infallibly, yet by the same providence he ordered them to fall out according to the nature of second causes, either necessarily, freely, or contingently. So we'll get to that when we get to chapter 5. But again, the emphasis is here is, all right, what we're saying about this is all comprehensive, sovereign, determining, predestinating will of God does not violate causation. He works according to the nature of second causes. So you go out in the jungle, you get torn apart by a lion. Um, you know, the lion is operating fun- uh, freely there. You freely put yourself in the jungle. The, the, Lion acted according to the nature of a lion and sought you out as food and, and, and so forth. Was that all in the plan and purpose of God? Yes. And yet God was working through second causes. And so things fall out, happen, occur ordinarily according to the nature of second causes. And when they don't operate according to the nature of the second causes, what, what, what do we call that when that kind of thing happens? Yeah, we call it a miracle. Um, uh, uh, nine one, God hath endued the will of man with that natural liberty that is neither forced nor by any absolute necessity of nature determined to good or evil. Uh, yes. Did I skip two? Oh, uh, surely you're wrong about that. I. Um, yeah. What becomes of human freedom? Yeah, that's a good. Uh, this is another explanation from the confession. Uh, he has endued us with natural liberty. So again, my arm is not being coerced. To do, I'm not being forced against my will. I'm, I'm acting naturally and freely in everything. You are freely here. No one dragged you into this room. Uh, was it the will of God for you to be here and to hear me going on and on about this stuff? Apparently it was, right? It was his will for you to be here this moment right now in this place. 
Uh, and maybe your wife tried to persuade you, those of you who have wives. Maybe she said, you really ought to go, and she was nagging you to go and all that. But in the end, you went because you wanted to go. Um, so, so the natural liberty, uh, oh, and uh, uh, Genesis 50, 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. This is one of the m most insightful and important of all the passages on this subject. Did, 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 um, uh, did Joseph's brothers mean it for evil? Yeah, they were going to kill him. And it said they just sold him into slavery, and then a whole string of events took place where, you know, Potiphar's wife, and he ends up back in prison. People in prison are getting executed left and right. Somehow he gets out, he ends up being, the, you know, the savior figure, the type of Christ for the whole family. Did they mean evil? Yes. Was it evil? Yes. Did God mean it? Did God mean for that to happen? Yes. Why? For good. What they meant for evil purposes, God meant for good purposes. Uh, and, then, and then this, um, again, this is, um, you know, Acts 4, we're really early in the history of the church. And Peter and, and is it Peter and James or Peter and John are taken into prison and, and released and they're back and join the other believers and they're worshiping and praying and uh, they say this, truly in this city they were gathered together against your, this is interpreting Psalm 2, uh, your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed, both Herod, Herod, Herod was responsible. Pontius Pilate, Pilate was responsible. The Gentiles, they were responsible. The people of Israel, they were responsible to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Greatest evil, greatest good. Did they do what they did freely? Yes, they freely did it. They chose to do what they did. And it was evil. It was greatest evil. And yet from, from it, God brought about the greatest good. Um, all right, we, we need to, we need to uh, can, so can we count that as, uh, what happens to free will? Uh, that, that, that'll come in another chapter. Uh, but the confession is saying we have free will in a limited sense, in the sense that we do what we want to do. There's a chapter on free will, so we'll get into that. But the understanding is we do what we want. The problem is what do we want, and that's determined by our nature, and that's our problem. Okay, take a break, five minutes. <laughs>